Welcome to the 15th lecture for AC1002. This lecture builds upon some of the information you would have got from the previous lectures on the building envelope. And it's important that you have watched the, the information on the heat loss and uh, the envelope general lecture before you watch this one. So we're going to be looking at air and therefore vapour. And we understand from previous lectures that the building envelope has many functions and one of those functions is controlling the flow of air and therefore vapour through the wall buildup. The air within a building holds all the vapour uh, from our activities and this lecture is going to look at where that moisture vapour comes from, how it affects wall construction and how we might control it through uh, construction layers and uh, mechanical means. So from the previous lectures, we, we know that moisture builds up within the, the, the building and the envelope has to handle that. But where is that moisture produced from? Um, mostly it's our occupation. We wash and we bathe, we shower, um, we uh, have baths and all that, that, that moisture is constantly feeding up into the, the, the internal atmosphere. So that's one significant source of, of, of water within the, within the atmosphere. We breathe and we sweat. Um, uh, if we're in a room and there's a number of different people, we'll all be putting out moisture within our, within our breath and, and from our bodies, and that moisture will then contribute to the amount of water vapor within the atmosphere. We dry clothes inside. Um, we Unfortunately, we live in a climate that sometimes drying clothes outside isn't possible, so we kind of get used to putting things on radiators or, uh, you know, hanging things within bathrooms. And the moisture within that, if you take a jumper out of the tumble dryer, it might have, you know, 300 to 500 milli millilitres of, of water in it if it hasn't been spun properly. And by the time it's dry, that, that moisture has to have gone somewhere and it'll have gone into, into the warm atmosphere inside the building. And cooking. If we're cooking pasta, we put you know, a litre of water into the, the, the pan and boil the pasta. And by the time we get to the end, there's uh, you know, 700 ml of water left. 300 millimeters, millilitres will have dissipated into the internal atmosphere. So there's quite a lot of moisture produced within buildings and we have to we have to deal with that and if we remember back to the the lecture about uh, heat loss and uh, we think of our friend Sir Isaac Newton and what he said was that heat flows spontaneously from hotter to colder bodies and never the reverse so it's always wanting to pass from the warmth inside to the cold outside that's that's the the, the transfer of heat so therefore, the warm air inside, which carries all that moisture, is flowing towards the outside. Air is wanting to pass through the, the, the construction to the cold outside. And wherever it carries that, that vapour, it's going to want to carry the vapour through the construction. So in diagram form, we can, we can think about how the walls built up. If we, if we imagine that this is a little section through a building, um, on one side we've got the interior and the opposite side we've got the exterior and this might be a timber frame with brickwork or blockwork outer leaf. So we've got an internal finish, our timber frame, uh, the sheathing is the, the brown stripe there and then we've got a ventilated air void, a masonry wall and an external render. And Along the side there, we can map on some, some temperature levels, so from 0 to, to 20. And if we said, for example, in this, uh, in this slide that we had 18 degrees as the inside temperature and 2 degrees for the outside temperature, using the conductivity of each of the materials, we can figure out where the, the, the temperature graph is, is going to be across this wall section. So we can figure out which temperature it's going to be at, at which particular point. And it might look something like this. It loses a little bit of heat through the, the thickness of the, the, the plasterboard. If the timber frame um, 
has insulation or doesn't have insulation, it's got to get down to the temperature of the ventilated air void by the time it gets through that thickness. The ventilated air void has air from the outside, so it's more or less at the external air temperature. It's maybe a little bit warmer, maybe one, one two degrees warmer. And from there, there's a little bit of heat loss across the ventilated void, and then the masonry wall is more or less constant. It's going to be at the temperature of the outside. So we can see that if we mapped on the temperature from our 18 degrees inside to the 2 degrees outside, the majority of that fall happens within the, within the timber frame. So the next thing we have to think about is, is humidity um, and, and how much water the, the, the air can hold. So relative humidity is the measure of water vapour density of air compared to the water vapour density of saturated air at the same temperature. So we're constantly trying to look for a percentage of a maximum amount. So when we're talking about the water vapour density of saturated air, that would be at it, you know, the maximum amount of water that that air could hold at that particular temperature. And the actual vapour density um, is then calculated R as RH, so it's a percentage of that. So thinking about that, as air cools, it's less able to hold moisture. Um, warmer air can hold more moisture and if the saturated uh, vapour density falls and that will then have an effect on, on the relative humidity because of the calculation so our relative humidity will rise so at the point where the RH reaches 100% that means that air is saturated and if the temperature continues to fall then there's no possibility that moisture can be held within the air so it will start to condense and it will form uh, moisture droplets. And that we would refer to as the, the, the dew point. So it's the point where water starts to condense at a given temperature um, and a given relative humidity. So if it reaches 100%. So if we think about our temperature graph, um, the temperature is falling through the wall, so therefore the dew point would fall through the wall. The point where the water vapour condenses is called the dew point. If it happens within the depth of a wall, it can mean that water is condensing within the wall, which can damage the fabric. So that's what we want to avoid. We want to try and get to a point where the dew point does not meet um, the temperature line within the, the depth of the wall. So as a graphic point there, we've got a red line, which is the, the temperature difference, and the blue line, which is the, the dew point. So at this point where the two of them meet, there may be a possibility that water would start to condense um, within the construction. It might be outside of the sheathing and outside of the breather membrane, which would be okay. If it's within the wall, then there's a possibility that you've got water forming within the construction, which will damage timbers in the long run. It'll cause um, uh, rot and mold to, to, to happen within the structural timbers and once the wall is constructed it's very difficult to get in about those things and, and sort them out. So how do we mitigate against this? Um, the most common method within timber frame, and we can see a timber frame there, is to install a, a vapour barrier or sometimes called a vapour check or a, um, a, a, a vapour control layer. So all those all those names are interchangeable. You can use uh, either one. And essentially what this is, it's a, a plastic sheet. It's a polythene um, sheet within the, the construction. And we would put that behind our internal finish. So we've got the, the light blue line of our vapour barrier there. And what that does is it stops air and therefore air carrying moisture from moving into the construction. But that means that most of the moist air is still handled or still held within the construction. It's not passing through the wall. Um, so we have to deal with it in some way. And the normal way to, to deal with that is either through passive methods or active methods. Now, passive means that um, there's no mechanical uh, apparatus involved in it. So a passive method might be to open a, a, a door or a window or a roof light. The mechanical methods or the active methods might be extract fans, which we would have in kitchens and bathrooms and utility rooms, 
Or in newer built houses, it might be a central ventilation system, which is an MVHR, which is a mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. But we'll look at those systems within um, the module later on when we talk about services. So in conclusion, vapour is produced within a building by a number of different methods. And unless we take care in specifying the materials in the construction, it can condense within the depth of the wall and cause damage. We can control uh, interstitial condensation by installing a vapour barrier, which is the plastic sheet that seals up the inside of the house. And we can use uh, active and passive systems to take the moisture away from the building in a controlled way. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that interstitial condensation can damage wall construction, that the dew point is the temperature at which vapour condenses, that a vapour barrier is useful in controlling vapour. Okay, in future lectures we'll look at uh, the vapour barrier will come up again and it's important that you understand the, the method by which we, we try and control it so that we can understand um, how the, the various other layers within the wall uh, participate in that activity. Okay, thanks for listening.